Oh, oh, you pressing record. I don't have to do anything here. Yes, as ready as whatever we are the phone. Hello and welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us online and at the table today. Uh, my name is Laura and this is Erin and we are both part of the team here at the People's Church in Constantia. Erin actually joined us about two months ago full time and Erin, hasn't it been a dream to work with people like us? <laughs> it's actually been wonderful. Thank you for dealing with me though. <laughs> no, you have been wonderful. Now, um, today Erin and I are gonna sort of attempt to preach together and to discuss a story uh, together and we're gonna see what's gonna happen and, and what comes out of it. But I have a question for you. Are you someone who changes your mind easily? Or would you say you are an immovable force? The person who just sticks to what they say and you cannot convince you otherwise, no matter what you say. What about you, Erin? Yeah, definitely immovable. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I actually think, to be honest, the people close to you would be the right people to answer this question rather than you, probably. Now, in my experience, and I'm afraid I do have lots of it, uh, my immov immovability has mostly been due to my pride. Uh, listen, I, I can commit to a conviction if I have one. And even if I, I realize halfway through that I'm wrong, I can see it through till the end, you know? I remember this one time and I, I have told the story before, but Hans and I, it was while we were in Jakarta and we drove past the golf course. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. We drove past the golf course and there was this, this sign that said golf on the wall. And I sort of snootily commented, they misspelled golf. And, um, and he's like, no, that's how you spell golf. And coming from an Afrikaans background, I clearly saw that the H was missing from the word golf. And I put my heels down and I was like, Hans, you are English second language. Like, what do you mean? I know how golf is spelled. As we all know, golf is not spelled with an H. And I was, you know, forced to humbly admit defeat because Google helped us out. Um, but we can be so sure and so confident of something that is in fact totally wrong. And I'm not the only one who's experienced this. I'm sure all of us watching but I do wonder with things that are a little bit more substantial than the spelling of the word golf, how much space there is in our lives and in our hearts for God to come and, and correct, for God to come in and, 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 and shift some of the things that we've so solidly believed to say, actually, what you're believing in your view of this is actually not correct. This is the truth. Maybe our convictions aren't totally based on God's truth. So my question is, how movable are we? Now, Jesus was traveling with his disciples and in a minute, Aaron's gonna read, um, but he was preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God. And he would meet with all kinds of people, usually around a table like this one. I'm sure much longer, much lower, they would be sitting on the floor. And, and he was on a mission of basically reframing the way that people saw life, changing their minds, saying, hey, this is the kingdom of God. This is who God is. You must see this and understand that. And so today we'll be looking at the story of the prodigal son. Um, and this story was specifically told to the religious leaders, to the elite and the holy, the immovable people. Um, so Lord, today, come and shift, come and change us. Let your word come and do its work in us. Amen. Amen. We often call it the, the prodigal son, but actually prodigal means lavish, to give it lavishly or extravagantly. Yeah. Actually, this whole entire story is about being lavish and extravagant. Yeah. It's about a God that gave his love lavishly and extravagantly yeah. to his two sons. So let me read Luke 15, verse 11. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told him this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want your, my share of the estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. We may not realize how extreme this request was, but at the time we told the story, family legacy and family honor was such a huge thing. So for the son to go and say to the father, I want my inheritance now, was basically saying, I don't care about you, I don't love you, I wish that you were dead. Mm. 
And what the father would have had to have done is he would have had to have sold his land, diminished the size of his land, sold his possessions, sold his cattle, just in order to give the son what he required. Let me carry on reading. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned both against heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned both against heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Again, this was extreme. We may not realize this now, but the Pharisees at the time would have been shocked to hear the story. Pigs were regarded as the filthiest of animals. Even to touch them was to defile oneself. It was the lowest form of humiliation. And to want to eat the pig's food, now that was unthinkable. But then the father went and ran and hugged a man that probably stank like a pig, <laughs> which was huge. Genuinely, the patriarch that in the Middle Eastern world would never run. Women would run, children would run, but the patriarch would never run, never mind embrace and kiss a son who stank like a pig stein. Yeah. Sure. But instead, the father said to him, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we had been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and now has returned home, returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. I'm continuing from verse 25. So meanwhile, the older son was in the field. This is the same story. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Just for a minute, I find it so interesting that the son went to the servant and to the slave to, to ask him what's going on. Almost like he related to the slave more than he did to his father. Why didn't he just go to his father and say, hey, dad, what's going on? What is this party about? Like, did I miss something? You know, but, but he had to go to the slave. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. And I'm just thinking, what does it, what it, what does it take for someone to plead with someone? When they're desperate, when you won't listen to reason, when you're immovable, um, and, uh, and, and again, I'm just thinking this father, his behavior is the opposite of a proud Jewish man. He's not saying, well, you know, this is my party coming. If you want, don't come in. He comes out and he pleads with him, um, which is putting all his pride aside. And then uh, he just re-invites his son, even though he was invited all along. But he says, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You know, last week, Hans, he spoke about a iceberg. And what we can see on top of the iceberg is all things that we can notice and see. And we see so much happening in the story. Yeah. But at the bottom of the iceberg is a thing that goes on in our hearts and in our minds, like the, what we believe, what we think, and the way we see things. 
And I wonder for a second we can dive into the way that they saw things or the way that they yeah. thought. The things that informed this that we just read. read. Absolutely, yes. Okay. So if we think about it, the younger son, he lived with the father for quite a while. He was a teenager at the time and maybe he was happy at first. But then something started happening in his heart and he started thinking, that's over there. That looks good. I want some of that. And we don't know what happened at, at that time, but he maybe he thought, I can make money there. I can have a good life over there. I can seek joy more in those places. Maybe I won't find that, that here. I'm not going to trust my father and his timing. I'm not going to trust that I'm going to get my inheritance later. Let me get it. Let me get it now. Mm -hmm. and I can so relate to this. I often, I pray to God for something, but then I do not wait. We often jump to the first thing that comes to us and take action into our own hands and wonder why God hasn't answered our prayers. We pray for our husband, but then we jump into the first destructive relationship that we can find. And we don't trust in God's timing. Or you pray for our husband and God gives you a wonderful man but then suddenly we start to see the flaws. Why is he being so stubborn? I do not deserve that. And then the seed is planted. There's countless research to show the way that you think changes the way that you behave. Dr. Caroline Leaf, I'm not sure if you know that name, but she's a clinical neuroscientist. And she says that when you think you build thoughts and these become physical substances in your brain. In other words, the more you think about something, your brain starts to be rewired and changes shapes. And those thought, thought patterns almost start to emerge and you believe them to be true, even if they are literally the furthest thing away from the truth. It's crazy. So eventually from thinking, why is my husband being so stubborn? You start to fight and every argument builds on this. And you keep thinking, oh, he's just being stubborn again. He's just being stubborn again. And the relationship goes downhill. And you do not remember what a wonderful man he was when he first got married. There's a reason why 1 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. When things start to go bad for the younger son and he loses all his wealth, he becomes so full of, of shame and of pride, he can't even think about going back to the father. And so his thoughts are naturally, I can't have anyone see that I failed. And I have to make things work on my own. And so he approaches a farmer in determination to make things work out. He even says to the farmer, the farmer, what can I do? And the farmer says, you have to feed these dirty, defiling pigs. Even then he does that. And he starts to become so hungry and again, his shame. He doesn't think I can go back to the father at this point. But again, he thinks, you know what? I actually wish I could eat this pig's food. Only when he hits rock bottom and the farmer says to him, no, I will not give you this food. Then suddenly he remembers the father. It just makes me think how often we try and cover up the things that we don't like about ourselves. We lie or we try to justify the things that we failed at. And before we know it, we're all clouded. You know, one lie covers the next, which covers the next. And then you've gone down a hill that you just can't get back from. And we wonder where we're wrong. I don't know if you can relate to anything. You know. <laughs> I, I was actually thinking the, I think the mistake that we can make when we read the story is to think that this is just for like super extreme rebels, you know, the people who go out and squander their money on prostitutes. But, but as you were talking about one thing covering up the next, I'm thinking about how often in my life, you know, I, I mess up, which we all do, but then somewhere along the line, I feel a little bit of shame that I've messed up. But instead of then admitting that I've messed up, I'd be like trying to justify because I'm good at talking. I can justify the things that I've done. So, so to give an example with a, in a friendship with someone, like I, I look back and I'm thinking, Hmm, maybe I did mess up, but now the, the, the pride in me is like, well, actually though, she did this and this and this. And so I'm pretty justified for the way that I acted and. And so, and so then I just, I'm like, you know what? Actually, I don't need her. Actually, I don't. And so it's this, it's this knock on effect of 
covering one thing with another thing and, and this mixture. And I'm even thinking, can you separate pride and shame? I think they're just one mingle most of like thing, you know, like they just yeah. stick together. Like they just, and, and it just obstructs my ability to just simply go and say, hey, I'm really sorry. I've messed up. I've made a bad decision. And so certainly I relate to this in a massive way. You know, it's wonderful. Allowing God to change the way that we think can almost make you into a new person. Yeah. It says in Romans 12 verse 2, yeah. do not copy the behavior and customs of the world, mm -hmm. but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Yo, that's so good. That speaks to me. <laughs> it really does. Um, you spoke earlier about the younger son initially, the, the thing that sort of started this whole, and obviously we're speculating, but it's just looking at this and, and knowing humanity and we're kind of deducting from that. But, but it started with thoughts of uh, my needs and my desires can't possibly be met by staying here. My, it, 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 like he had this idea that the father was holding out on him. He was withholding something from him or, or that he was withholding the fullness of what was owed to him somehow. And then although the older son had totally different behavior uh, to the younger one, I actually think that that lie of the father is holding out on me existed in both their minds and hearts. The older son was doing the right things. He was in the field. He was faithful. You know, he's the guy who always did the right things. But the thing is, all of us, even right thing doers, those of us, um, we want some sort of result or reward from doing the right thing. Even if we say we don't, even if we say, I simply want to do the right thing, we want some sort of reward. And whether, th whether that reward is recognition or, you know, of you, you work so hard or, you know, wow, you really always do things properly or you don't do them at all. Hey, I see you. I, like we want that sort of, that, that, that feedback that confirms our identity, like, yes, I am that person, you know? A and what happens then when our identity shifts from just being the son who is helping the father to I am the one who gets everything around here done, the whole narrative around our work and our lives changes. And, and when we don't get the res recognition or, or the results that this narrative requires, this I am the get a dunner, we start becoming bitter. His brother, this brother was clearly bitter. And, and so there's, a, there's, there's some things about bitterness that we need to know. It doesn't happen overnight, first of all. Bitterness doesn't just happen once and now I'm bitter. Mm -hmm. Bitterness is usually something that starts small and it accumulates over time. It's an accumulation of lots and lots of little moments that just confirm our bitter narrative. Hebrews 12 verse 15 says, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. Bitterness starts with a little root of offense and then it just keeps growing as we feed it. You know, I, I can totally relate to that. So before I joined here at TPC, I actually was a physiotherapist and I had my first baby and I was pregnant. I hadn't yet had the baby. And I went to one of the prophetess. I said to him, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm wanting to start my own, my own business. I want to start my own practice. Imagine if we joined forces together and started this thing where anyone who couldn't afford prosthetic legs, those are like the legs that if you've had an amputation, you work on those legs, those legs. <laughs> If we, if, <laughs> if we start a, a company where we, or an NGO, where we can supply legs to people that can't afford it and can't get in the government setting. And so he was like, that is a wonderful idea. Let's do that. And then I went to maternity leave and, and COVID started to hit and it just became, life was just a bit crazy. And he suddenly started this NGO and it was wonderful. He got people in, he got directors in. And it's actually a wonderful, a wonderful NGO that's now functioning now. But initially I thought, hey, that was my idea. Sure. Why am I not getting recognized here? Why am I not part of this? Yeah. Um, why, why is my name not there? And instead of thinking, wow, we are actually helping so many people here. 
I started to feel bitter. And, and I lost the reason why I wanted to do it in the first place. I just wanted that recognition. Funny enough, I'm actually very involved in it now, um, just from the cl cl clinical side. Um, but at the time, it was, it, was a really, it was a really hard thing. Yeah. And I had to recognize that and say, hey, wait a second. Yeah. Why did I want to do this in the first place? Wow, sure. That's so good. Um, it's, it's, I was just about to say that the thing about, the, the one thing that causes bitterness is offense or being wrongly treated, which, yeah, I can see how you, how you would have felt like that. Um, but another one that probably all of us can relate to is disappointment. Disappointments can make us bitter, uh, even if it's nobody's fault in particular. But what happens often is when we're disappointed, we like to find someone to blame. So, you know, uh, there's a few areas in disappointment that's common. Marriage. When I say this last time, somebody laughed and they're like, are you disappointed in your marriage? And I'm like, no, I love my marriage. But if I say that it's exactly as I thought it was going to be the day when I said I do, I'm going to lie because there's a lot of realities that I've had to come to deal. Like, you are not Prince Charming, like not by any means. And I am definitely not the easiest person. I think it's vice versa. And I think, but often what happens, and I, I think this is what everybody experiences to some extent, if we're really honest. This is not exactly what I pictured and it's probably better. But if we allow the disappointments that's come in there, the things that we're like, well, I thought you were going to be the, or I thought this, what can happen is that we can slowly grow bitter. You mentioned it, like the, the spouse that's so stubborn, I'm assuming you weren't speaking about your own husband, but, 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 but it's something that we have to deal with. Like there's bitterness that can come in if we allow it to accumulate and allow this disappointment to, to form a narrative. Um, you know, and then the other one, the big one where we face disappointment is in church. Um, I realized that there's probably a lot of people watching today whose experiences, maybe because of a moral failure of a leader, they weren't who you thought you were, they were, or there was some scandal, who knows, or, or perhaps you just felt like you were unfairly treated or, or perhaps you feel like you were taken advantage of in some way. Or maybe it's as simple as people just didn't show up for you the way that you expected or imagined they would. And what happens in that moment is that a hardness can develop in us when we experience those things. And, and it's, it really is a choice and it really is a moment of becoming aware of that feeling inside of you because here's the problem. Just like a marriage, a church is so imperfect and it's made out of broken people and most likely somebody will disappoint you and they might very much hurt you. And I'm not saying it's fine, but it's reality. And so the thing is, we're going to have to, to say, okay, God, what's happening inside of my heart here? Um, what narrative is starting to form here? Um, and then maybe it's not something specific like a marriage or a or a you know, church situation, but sometimes just overall, I think we can feel disappointed with our lives. We can feel disappointed with God, I guess, if we're honest, we can feel like, listen, God, I said, I'm going to follow you. And, and we had all these big plans that I was excited and expectant for, but, but here I am. And my life feels like I'm just like this throwaway person. And why is my life looking like this? And I, and I think we can become like God. I was faithful, I did my part, but here I am. And you couldn't even answer that one prayer. And what happens is again, we build this narrative and slowly but surely bitterness and hardness can form in our heart. And, and this is, I think, a sign to us. Um, you know, some people are like, well, I'm out, like the younger son. I can't take this, gone, cheers. Others of us, we continue. We, I'm still serving God. I'm still in the church. I'm still in my marriage. <laughs> I'm doing all the things. But a clear sign that sometimes our hearts have become hard is when we've lost our joy. When we've lost our joy with any of those things about serving God, about serving the church, about our spouse and our marriage. It's kind of like an attitude of fine. I'll do it, but don't expect me to be happy. You know, and um, I think, I think for this older brother, the younger brother coming home wasn't actually the issue. Uh, you know, the issue was there all along. He's been bitter for a very long time already. You know, I had this narrative of, you know, this Afrikaans saying that says stunk for dunk. Like it's, it's like this thing of like, 
you know, you really shouldn't give me a thank you, but all you give me is an insult. You know, that's kind of the, the thing. And I think this is this narrative that this brother had. So every time his dad would ask him something, he would just be like, oh, here we go again. Working like a slave, if you know. And he, he had this thing in his mind. Nobody sees me. Nobody appreciates me. And I'm just the guy who gets it all done. And, and I think that, sorry, just the younger brother just basically revealed all of that that was already in him. You know, the thing that sets the younger brother apart in the story is that he had a, an aha moment. Yeah. It, says, it says in the Bible that he finally came to his senses. And he had a moment where he thought, you know, wait, I don't have to go down this path. I don't have to live this yeah. way. Yeah. And he finally remembered, firstly, where is my identity? I'm, I'm my father's son. I have a home. I, I can go back to him. I do not have to live this life. He right. suddenly realized who, who he was. Yeah. And the second thing is he suddenly remembered who his father was. He was kind. He was generous. He must have known who could go back. Yeah, sure. Yeah, even if it wasn't necessarily as a son, but at least his father would take him back as a slave, right? Absolutely. Sure. And I think just on that the best part of that because i think it is true the, the younger son was like he's a good guy like he takes even bad people in so surely you know he can he can at least give me a job at the very least but, but what's the best part of the story no doubt was the response of the father i mean it was just so generous and um and it's, I think the son maybe thought, I'm going to have to sort of shuffle across on my knees. But then the father ran to him before he could even get down, you know. And, and not only was he like, fine, you can come back. But he was like happy to see him. And he was instantly restored back to being his son. And I wonder today how many of us watching maybe find ourselves heading in a certain direction. Maybe a trajectory of certain relationship breakdown, maybe a trajectory of greed. I, I think some of us at some point said, listen, I want to live my life for Jesus. I want to give of myself. I want to give of my stuff. I want to give away. But somehow something in life happened and you've just been accumulating. You've been doing the opposite of, of living a generous life or, or maybe just a general trajectory of moving further and further away from God and for his plan for your life. And perhaps you've noticed to some extent, like, actually, I, I want to, I want to turn around. I want to, I want to go back to God, but the journey there just looks really hard. It takes bravery and courage to turn around. But can I invite you today to take a step to, to go one step beyond remembering because the son remembered and he came to his senses and then he actually physically turned around and he went back home. And when he got to the father, it's, the father's response was restoration, not punishment. And I think our logic somehow can't handle that. That's never what we imagine when we picture the scene. This son's story was one of repentance. And the Greek verb for repentance actually means to change one's mind. But the sad part was for the other son. The one who, who was doing the things, but, but his mind was never ever changed. And I think Jesus left that story hanging on purpose so that the people that he was talking to could decide, like, what's my next step? Am I going to turn around and leave for good? Am I going to reject the Father's invitation? Or am I going to just let go of my pride? Am I going to accept the invitation and go in to the banquet? Proverbs 18 verse 19 says, An offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separate friends like a gate locked with bars. There's something about offense and bitterness that hardens us like nothing else. And usually that hard shell is made up of self-righteousness. I've certainly had that sh shell. Sure, I'm feeling this. I can admit, but I'm justified in feeling this way. That's what we tell ourselves. Last week, Hans spoke about taking off jackets. They said the jackets are like the, the shields uh, or the layers that we put on to protect ourselves or to hide us, to hide what's truly going on inside of us. But the lie about these layers that we believe is that they help us. It's a lie because they don't. 
the brother, the whole time where he was standing outside, bitter in the field, doing his thing and working his narrative, going over and yeah, I did it, you know, like all of that. The whole time he was doing that, there was a table, a place set for him in that table. The father was waiting for him to join in the celebrations. There was something for him the whole time. But his jacket, his offense, his self-righteousness was the thing that kept him outside. It wasn't his father, but himself. And it was the thing that made him a slave rather than a son. And I know for a fact that there are some people watching today, perhaps it's you, who feel that God is perhaps coming out of the banquet today and saying, hey, come inside. Your table, your, your, your place has been set. I plead with you. I have a plan for you. I want you to be a part of what my future is. I want you to be a part of what I am doing in this world. And perhaps if that's you today, perhaps if you feel like God is inviting you, I want to invite you to respond. And, um, and right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. We're going to pray together. And if, if you want to pray this prayer, just put your hand on your heart. Just to say, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm part of this. I'm included in this. So Jesus, thank you that wherever we find ourselves today, you are, you are here and you are inviting us. And in Psalms, it speaks about how your goodness runs after us. It's chasing after us. And that's so true in the story. You, you come after us, even when we're prideful, even when we're hard-hearted, even when we've been rebellious, you run towards us. And so God, I pray that today we won't be people who miss out on the opportunity, but would you soften our hearts? Can we, can we make that decision today, Jesus, to say, Lord, I want to come inside. I want you to come in and, and work on the things in my heart that is actually damaging me. And so Jesus, we give, we want to try at least and give these things to you, give these offenses and these struggles and these desires. We want to give them to you and say, Jesus, we want to trust you that you're a good father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs>